Hello, my name is Grant Larson, and thanks so much for taking the time to come to this virtual clinic on rhythmic and progressive etude study for high school saxophonists. In my current role at Denver School of the Arts, I've had the opportunity to serve high school saxophonists for the past seven years. During my time there, I've noticed some things and aspects of a saxophonist development that plague high school level saxophonists. The etudes that I composed were intended to focus on specific topics and or aspects of a saxophonist playing that high school saxophonists struggle with. Each etude is relatively short with the idea that a saxophonist at that age level would be able to successfully prepare that etude within a week's time frame. In today's clinic, I will present a few of the topics that each of the etudes focuses on I'll play some examples from each etude and also give some pedagogical ideas on how saxophonists might go about in practicing and or studying these etudes. As we all know, rhythm is a huge, important aspect of any musician's development. These etudes are specifically meant to focus on a variety of rhythmic subdivisions. In this first etude that you just heard, we focus on eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenth notes, with one little quintuplet at the very end. I believe it is very important for a developing saxophonist to externalize rhythm in order to be able to internalize it as they develop. By that I mean externalizing it, I mean either speaking, singing, or a combination of, of speaking and clapping rhythms. A student might work on this by obviously using their metronome, putting the metronome on at a slower tempo, slightly under tempo, and speaking or singing the rhythms simply as one and two and three and four and one with eighth notes, or with clapping, one and two and three and four and one, making sure that the subdivision, in this case eighth notes, is very even. Moving on to triplets would be the same thing. One and a two and a three and a four and a one. Externalizing it vocally, also with movement, clapping. One and a two and a three and a four and a one. Same thing with sixteenth notes. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one. It's the diction that is really important. It's just like we would be focusing on articulation when we're playing. In this case, we're focusing on speaking things clearly and very evenly, internalizing that subdivision. Then by practicing it that way, when you transfer it to the horn, hopefully things will be just as even as you spoke it. tempo that is comfortable, which want, you could really succeed. I always encourage my students to start slowly and incrementally work their way up as they get better at any given tempo. The next two aspects of rhythmic subdivision that I want to focus on deal with syncopation. Syncopation can certainly be tricky for anyone, but especially for developing saxophonists at the high school level. The key again, in my opinion, is to be able to first of all know what the counting is 
in any given syncopated section, know how to speak it clearly with very good time, and not only time between the larger beats, but also between the subdivisions, right? Making sure that if it's a 16th note subdivision with syncopation, that it's very clear if it's a triplet subdivision or if it's an eighth note subdivision. <laughs> is being able to externalize trickier rhythms or rhythmic subdivisions, such as sextuplets. It's something that we see in our repertoire a fair bit, <clears throat> and usually when a student at the high school level sees sextuplets or quintuplets, they don't quite know how to speak or count them, and thus they're unsure of how to play them evenly. So in this example, in etude number two, we have uh, a sextuplet subdivision throughout most of the etude. I like to count sextuplet subdivisions by speaking it. One to latalita, two to latalita, three to latalita. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but that way again, you're speaking it clearly, you're feeling the subdivision, and hopefully then that transfers over to when you would play it. <laughs> Although not as intricate as the previously discussed rhythmic subdivisions, being able to subdivide 16th notes and 8th notes in triple meter is very important. These next two etudes, etude 4 and number 6, deal with triple meter, specifically 3-8 time in number 4 and 6-8 time in number 6. It is equally important for students at the high school level to be able to subdivide and play rhythmically accurate in triple meter. Playing intervals, especially larger intervallic leaps, can be difficult for any saxophonist. Um, in my experience dealing with high school saxophonists, oftentimes when leaping down and with larger intervals, the note that we're going to either kind of get swept under the rug or the sound isn't full, they may crack the pitch, <clears throat> partially because they haven't developed that flexibility of voicing 
and they're just still getting used to things with the embouchure, the fundamentals of embouchure air and voicing. Um, and so in almost all of the etudes that I composed, I tried to focus on some type of intervallic work that would aid this kind of development. In specifically, I'm going to talk about etude number five and number nine. Both these etudes focus on larger intervallic leaps downward and in ascending uh, fashion. And in, especially in etude number nine, it focuses on octave intervals, which you know, we're great, we're fortunate to have some great um, variety of that in the Fairling Etudes and other um, great resources that we have as saxophonists. But oftentimes those can be almost too difficult for, for students at the high school level. And so Etude number nine, and I'm going to play an example of here in a second, focuses on octave intervals with a variety of rhythms again, eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenth notes, um, working between the range of the instrument, so it kind of goes all the way down to low B in this case and works up into the palm keys in octave fashion. examples that I want to highlight from etude number five that deal with some intervallic work in both ascending and descending motion. Starting on the third line in measure number nine, we have a sequence in which you have two repeated pitches that leaps down and goes up scalarly, followed by another couple of repeated pitches leaping down again. And the idea with this is that as the saxophonist plays through this line, leaping down, everything would stay smooth, just as if you were playing a normal scale. However, we're including that intervallic leap down. Again, making sure the sound is consistent, full, and that the low note does not get swept under the rug. When you get to the 16th notes, there's a couple of um, instances where we have octave intervals up in a quick fashion. The idea is that both F-sharp in this case, both F-sharps are the exact same sound quality and that there is no crack between them. Etude number nine primarily deals with octaves, both in the ascending fashion and in descending fashion. <clears throat> I think there are two aspects of really working on octaves that are super important. One being the sound and two being intonation. We want there to be little to no sound quality difference between them, either when we're leaping up or leaping down. And two, we certainly don't want there to be an intonation change, which can be definitely tricky, especially when you're leaping up higher in the range. In etude number nine, there are a couple instances where I think are very important to highlight. I'm gonna start at the beginning and play just the first few measures, focusing on those first few octave intervals. Again, I would probably encourage students to just highlight those octave intervals. Play them slowly back and forth. or as much as you as little as you can possibly make and then also really trying to hear the intonation in this instance uh, having the students sing or verbalize the octave interval would be very very beneficial 
sing it, you'll be able to play it in tune better. Later on in the etude, we have some larger intervallic leaps that ascend in the fourth line, for example. go sharp, especially when going into the palm keys, like in measure 13. I would really encourage students to play, ignore the rhythm, play each pitch, internalize how it sounds, play the octave, whether it's ascending or descending, internalize how that sounds, and use your ear to try to match as, as, as good as you possibly can. In this instance, having a drone going in the key center would be very beneficial. In this case, it would be concert E flat. And that's a great way to not only work on your skills as a saxophonist, but also your skills for ear training. One more etude that focuses on various aspects of interval training is etude number 10. This etude focuses on a little bit different uh, fashion though. In this etude, <clears throat> we're primarily dealing with intervals pertaining to an arpeggio or within one key. Uh, this etude really m goes through different harmonic concepts though. It doesn't stick in one key the entire time. And I think that's really good for a couple things um, for high school saxophones to kind of develop. One is just their ear again, being able to hear when things change. And also theoretically, if they hear it changes, where are we going? Where is this etude going? They can even use it as a theory exercise to figure out what the relationship between these various um, harmonic concepts is. In this etude, <clears throat> we're trying to make sure that, again, as we leap, either ascending or descending, really keeping consistent sound, consistent phrasing as well, making sure that the rhythm isn't affected by the interval, and also your dynamic. The final topic that I want to discuss in today's clinic has to do with articulation. I'm definitely biased, but I believe the saxophone has the ability to provide the greatest variety of articulation out of any of the wind instruments. Um, and our repertoire definitely demonstrates that. <clears throat> For developing saxophonists, learning the variety of articulation and also the nuance that is associated with all the different articulations can certainly be tricky. Throughout these 10 etudes that I've composed for high school level saxophones, I've tried to incorporate a few of the main types of articulations that a typical high school saxophonist would see in either their wind ensemble or band literature and also in their solo literature that they might be studying. Those articulations include normal tongued articulations, slurs, staccato, accents, and a combination of asymmetric uh, slurring groupings, slur groupings. You've heard throughout this clinic a variety of the articulations already used, so I'm primarily going to focus on this aspect of asymmetric slur groupings, which can be found in etude number eight. In this particular etude, what I tried to do 
was start off by using two note groupings of slurs, then going to three, moving on to four, five, etc. Right? And in my experience, again, I've found that high school saxophonists have a tough time controlling sometimes where they tongue while worrying about rhythm, while worrying about pitch content, while worrying about fingerings on the instrument. And so this is a way to incorporate kind of those various aspects into one um, articulation focused etude. Throughout this eighth etude, there are articulation challenges that are presented to the saxophonist. Namely, the groupings of slurrings that go against the grouping of the triplet rhythm. For example, at the beginning, we have two triplet eighth notes slurred together with the triplet rhythm. So the idea is that the saxophonist would really concentrate on that kind of asymmetric feeling of two versus three, that hemiola feel, two versus three, rhythm to, or articulation to rhythm. <laughs> kind of cool sound and a very unique feel. Then it moves on to three, which is not as difficult because you are slurring the same number of pitches which are in the triplet rhythm. We get to the next um, slur grouping, which is four tr uh, triplet eighth notes in one grouping, and that becomes a little bit more difficult. One of the ways that I like to have my students practice this concept is to just focus on where the articulation lands. So I would put my metronome on, again I'm going to put it slightly slower, and I'm just going to um, worry about where the articulation lands. One and a, two and a, three and a, oh. So that it lands in that kind of weird spot, but you're feeling that triplet subdivision, one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a, and then you practice that course with all the pitches. same thing when it moves on to five and then greater groupings. These are definitely challenges that present all of us, but especially at this age grouping, I've found that an etude like this that really focuses on where to articulate can really benefit the high school saxophonist. Again, I thank you so much for taking the time to come to this virtual clinic on rhythmic and progressive etude study for saxophonists. Um, I'm certainly not trying to reinvent the wheel with these etudes. You know, we are very fortunate to have a plethora of great etude studies for saxophone. <clears throat> but I think sometimes uh, those etude studies that we all have to work through and study and um, practice at some point in our development are often just a little bit too difficult or too long for the high school aged saxophones. So my hope is that these groupings of, a, of etudes will aid high school saxophonists in their development of namely rhythm, intervallic work, and articulation in um, a, kind of a shorter condensed etude form. If you have any questions about anything that you heard in this clinic or would like to reach out, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Or if you are interested in etudes, they can be found on my website and I'll leave a link down below. Thanks so much. Have a great day.